when Jonathan very kindly invited me to come here, and this is a, a pleasure to be invited to the Centre to, for, for Fiction to, uh, to speak, I occasionally get invited by uh, various universities in the UK, and I was asked by uh, one of the major universities to deliver what they called a plenary lecture, which I looked up and discovered meant unqualified. So that, that seemed quite appropriate, really. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about, about crime fiction, about the difference between mystery and suspense, and also about finding the right starting off point, or where we, how we choose the right starting off point for a, for a novel. I mean, one of the first things we, we look at is why is crime so popular? Because it does seem to be one of the most popular genres. And in fact, in Brit the British Library system, it is the most borrowed uh, genre of books throughout the British Library system, and has been for some years. And I think partly it's because it's the, it offers the chance for justice, which is often so missing in the real world. If you have something stolen, you know the police might turn out, or they might not. In the UK, they just you ring them up, they give you a crime number for your insurance, and often they don't even bother to turn out at all. Um, you're probably never going to get the stuff back, you're never going to find out what happened to the people who stole it, probably nothing. So it's an unfinished story. In a crime novel you get a resolution to that story and usually you get some form of justice. And occasionally it's legal and occasionally it's just justice. So I think that um, often you only hear a sort of a tantalising snatch of a story on the news. And that is what we often take to say, what if, what if something else happened with that? And we go on and we build that into a crime novel. I remember hearing a story on the, the British news some years ago now, and I never heard the rest of this, so I never found out what happened. But a car was found that had gone off the edge of a freeway and crashed, and the driver was killed in the accident. And when the police arrived, they discovered there was already a body in the trunk of the car. <laughs> but we never found out any more about that. It was never really reported on the news. But that is the start of a novel for a, for a crime writer. That's where you take and go, what happened? <laughs> so, and in fact, I'm going to go a little bit into um, first lines for, for novels. But there is a very appropriate one I have that, that kind of goes with that. That's by a writer called Victor Gishler. And the, the opening line of his novel, Gun Monkeys, is I turn the Chrysler onto the Florida Turnpike with Rollo Kramer's headless body in the trunk and all the time I'm thinking, I should have put some plastic down. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of goes with that story. So when we look at a novel in general, I mean, what's the most important aspect of the, the novel? Is it character? You don't have to like the characters, but you have to be engaged by them. You have to want to find out what happens by, for, to those characters. But you don't necessarily have to fall in love with them. You need imagination to write a novel. There's no limit to where you can go on the journeys you take inside your own head. And that's one of the things I've always loved about writing. You don't need sort of vast amounts of, uh, of income to train or to set up for it. All you need is what's inside your head and a sheaf, a sheaf of paper and a pencil and you can start and keep going. You need originality for a novel, because there are so many novels you pick up and you think, oh, I've heard this idea, of this plot, this synopsis so many times before. So it needs to be an original idea. And I know there are only a set number of plots, but you need an original spin on that idea. So you need something that's different, something that will make a reader or an editor or a publisher go, hmm, I like the sound of that. So you need pace for a novel. It doesn't matter whether you're um, writing a cosy or you're writing a techno thriller. It's still got to have pace. It's still got to keep the story moving forwards and it's still got to keep the reader turning the pages. You need plot, obviously, for a novel. It's got to make sense, it's got to be logical and it's got to be realistic within the boundaries of the world you create. It doesn't necessarily have to be real. If you actually shadowed a private eye do going about his normal work and then you tried to write a novel that was real to his work, it would be a very, very boring novel because he would spend an awful lot of time 
watching people who have claimed they've injured themselves and, and are trying to con their insurance company for payments, or maybe watching the wife of uh, a husband who suspects his spouse is cheating on him. But they would not get embroiled, embroiled in murder cases. They would not be tripping over bodies every five minutes. So you have to take the, the realistic edge. It has to be realistic rather than real. You have to take something that sounds authentic, that sounds like it might happen, but you know you're cutting out all the boring parts. But to me, the most important part of writing a novel is the voice of the writer. You have to develop a voice that people like the sound of. And you as a reader can tell that very, very easily. You pick up a book, you open it, you read the first sentence even, maybe the first paragraph, and you know instinctively whether you like the sound of that writer's voice or not. And it's something to do with the way they use the words, the way they cut up the sentences, the phrasing, and almost the rhythm of the, of the way the words go. And you know that, and you know you're going to read on long before you found out whether you're engaged by the characters and whether you like the story. So we're here tonight really to talk about sort of writing suspense, writing mystery, thrillers, crime novels. And how do you define suspense? Well, partly it's about, it's not what's happening now, it's what might happen, what could happen. It's uncertain situations where the outcome is in some doubt. And it's a question, concern, or a threat that is not immediately addressed. So every time you answer a question for your main character, you have to ask another one. And it's not just answering a question, it's um, resolving a situation. Because really, they say you should put your character up a tree and throw rocks at them. You need this conflict to keep driving the story forward. It's quite often debated, even among um, writers who are writing them, what is the difference between a mystery and a thriller? And this is why I said you need Payson to make the novel page turning, because n not necessarily is a, is a book that um, you would say is a page turner, it's not necessarily a thriller. And there are some sort of very generalised guidelines, and I use the word very generalised advisedly, about what is the difference between a mystery and a thriller. Quite often in a mystery, the reader will be on the same page as the protagonist. They will be finding things out at the same time your main character or characters find out the information. Whereas in a thriller, the reader is quite often ahead of the protagonist. You will see something developing and you know it's going to land on your main character, but they haven't realised that yet. Um, usually you'll have in a mystery something terrible has happened and your main character or characters are trying to return, have a return to normality. They're trying to put things right. They're trying to solve a murder. They're trying to um, have a, a return to that kind of order. Whereas quite often in a thriller, you'll be trying to prevent a catastrophe. So you set off in the normal world and you're trying to stop something dreadful happening. Um, quite often in a, in a mystery, the protagonist will be the sleuth. They don't necessarily have to be professional sleuth, very often they're not, um, and also in a thriller, you, um, the, the protagonist is the hero, they can often be unskilled, they're thrown in uh, beyond their, their depth and they have to fight to overcome this new situation as much as um, the events that are happening. So a mystery is often a large canvas that narrows down to a, a, an eventual situation. Whereas a thriller, you'll quite often have things escalating. So you start from a, a narrow viewpoint and they escalate outwards as things go horribly wrong, as they're likely to do. Um, mysteries can not quite often be more cerebral. Um, and I don't just mean that, that uh, the main character will be solving crossword puzzles in the, in the course of events. They will be more cerebral, it will be more of a puzzle. Whereas a thriller can be often more emotional. And um, for some reason, in a mystery, the deaths are often more inventive. I did find, they did a, a survey for the Crime Writers Association of the various different methods of, uh, of murder. And death by euphonium, I think, was the obvious <laughs> one they, uh, they found. And, but in a, a thriller, the deaths can often be more prosaic, but on, on a somewhat larger scale. And you do have to be very careful when you're... Um, upping your body count in any book, that the deaths mean something. You can't just say, oh, it's time I killed somebody else off on the page. 
Um, they have to mean something to your reader, otherwise they just get numb with it. So, as I've said, ideas you'll quite often find on the news for, for crime and thriller books. You'll see a snippet of something and think, ooh, that, that, I wonder if I just extrapolated that a bit further, if I just took that a bit further, what would happen if? But avoiding cliches in, in plotting. You know, there's always the books that start with a woman who's married and she discovers when her husband dies unexpectedly that he's been leading a double life. You have to have a really original twist on something like that to, to get past the, the slight groan induced by the cliché of that sort of a plot. Um, very briefly, I'll tell you how I, how I came to write the, the latest book in the Charlie Fox series, which is a novella called Absence of Light. And I went to see um, a home office pathologist in the UK who was just, he was giving a lecture, he was giving a talk, and he'd been head of the disaster victim identification team, which went to Christchurch after the major earthquake there, to reconcile the recovered bodies. And he was talking about how they went about that business. And he said that they, although they are only concerned with the identification, um, they're not concerned with the rescue of people who aren't, don't yet actually classify as a corpse. He said that was left. The glamorous side of the job, he said, the bit that gets on the news, where they pull somebody out of the rubble after 28 days, he said that, that side is always kind of taken by somebody else. And he did all the identifying. But his team included a trauma surgeon who was also a pathologist. Um, it included a forensic odontologist, because quite often they will find um, bits of things like teeth that they have to piece back together and apparently this guy was sticking them to cardboard to try and um, create a full dental record. But he said the last thing they do is allow relatives or friends of, of the dead to try and identify them, which surprised me. I thought that would have been you know, the first people they called on. But he said he found we had a big uh, disaster in a football stadium in the UK, uh, the Hillsborough disaster where a large number of people were, there was a crush, and they were crushed against the front of the barriers, and a lot of people died. And they found when they were trying to get these people identified, that quite often they would get too many false positives and too many false negatives. He said that so many people were desperate for closure on their relatives, that they would identify bodies even when they weren't uh, those that they were thought to be. And you'd also get people who were in denial, they would say, that can't possibly be my son, my husband, my sister. They would completely deny it. They said they also are very careful about uh, using tattoos for identification. Mm -hmm. Because do you know if, you're, if you have children, do you know if they have any tattoos? Have they told you about them? Would they tell you about them? If you have tattoos, how long was it before you told your parents? So they don't use those either, but they use things like the identity, the serial numbers on uh, surgical implants, they use the dental records, they use belongings that are found, and only almost once they've identified the victim do they reconcile them with their relatives. So this idea that there would be some immediate um, sort of haziness over the identity of somebody, I thought, well, that's a very interesting idea. I like the fact that because you can build your own world and, and make your own rules, well I thought I'd bend them a little and I would have my recovery team also as the rescue team so they were one body of people who were digging people out of the rubble as well as identifying the bodies. So I had my, my trauma surgeon, I had somebody who was a structural engineer because I thought if they're going to go into buildings they need to know if they're safe, they need to know whether they can go into them or not. I needed somebody because all the infrastructure often disappears and a lot of roads um, and all the, the communications network was destroyed. Well, we need to be able to get casualties to, to, uh, uh, to treatment quickly. So I had a helicopter pilot and they're always good fun to play around with. Um, and um, I had, uh, and he also kind of doubled as a little bit of a fixer. He was the guy you went to who could always get hold of stuff. And you need a, a search and rescue dog. And don't worry, nothing happens to the dog. <laughs> you have to point this out because people get very worried about what happens to uh, any animals who are included. You have to have the little thing like they have at the end of, of movies saying, no animals were injured in the making of this. You can kill off people left, right and centre, but animals, no. Um, somebody, I, I saw on Facebook, somebody said that uh, 
that when a, a dog is potentially in peril in a book, yes, you, you do have to, to say nothing will happen to the dog. If there's a cat in peril, you don't have to say anything because everyone knows the cat may be fine. <laughs> Which is very true. Um, so I had the dog. And I had to, and nothing happens to the dog. And I had her handler, and that gave me a nice, interesting mix of people that I could sort of parachute my my main character into. And because these people have worked together previously in very dangerous situations, Charlie, my my character, was always going to be an outsider. And then I threw into the mix because you always take well, well, what would what would complicate this? What would create a little more conflict within this group? So I said, well, okay, she goes in as, as their security advisor because obviously, as I've said, there's been a breakdown in law and order, so they need somebody to, to try and keep them safe while they're, they're working on this. And Charlie went in as their security advisor. And um, she has to try and find out also what happened to their previous security advisor who, who died on the last job in somewhat mysterious circumstances. So there I had my basic setup. And I got all this wonderful information from Bill, who was the, the pathologist. And uh, I also, because you develop these, these terrific contacts you build up. And even if you don't have any when you start writing, you kind of, you accumulate people who, who have weird and wonderful jobs. And a, a friend of mine is a retired pilot. And I was able to pick his brains about, about the, uh, the sort of very complex uh, problems of, of bringing a helicopter in very close to, uh, to a cliff face. I also, in one of the other books, asked him in great detail about what happens when you crash a helicopter because I know he has done so on several occasions. <laughs> but yes, I've never got actually into a flying machine with him and I'm not sure I would. Um, so if you have a bit of a fairly simple, str strong idea, is always going to be um, sort of better than a very, very overly complicated premise. Um, so the first thing I do before I actually start writing is, is I write my own jacket copy. The, what they call the flap copy, it's usually on the inside flap of the hardcover or it's on the back jacket of the, um, of the paperback. And that tells me what the basic idea of the book is and I can show that to somebody, it's half a page, and say, if, this was, if you pick this book up, would you want to read it? And if they engage their reactions from that. But it also keeps me focused on what the, you know, the real important parts of the book are. And also that helps give me my jumping off point for the plot. Because there's no point in spending a long you know, spending um, time getting into the story if on the jacket copy the reader is all, all, all the way. Oh, I should just have another drink while I put my teeth back in. <laughs> So I try and, uh, and pick my jumping off point so that uh, the, the reader is primed by the point they've reached in the story on the, the, the jacket copy. I remember somebody's uh, book I picked up and read and it said um, that uh, this particular private detective realised that all the people who were, who were connected in some way with a certain local hospital were dying horribly. That was great. But unfortunately, the main character didn't make that connection until 170 yeah. pages into the novel, which somewhat spoiled the suspense because the reader was sitting there, in my case, going, come on, come on, will you get with the programme and catch up with this a little bit? So it's also useful to write that jacket copy because you have to have, these days, what's known as an elevator pitch. Mm -hmm. Now, your elevator pitch is you get into an elevator on the top <laughs> floor of a hotel and you have to find a... A well-known New York publisher is in the elevator with you and you have as long as it takes for the elevator to get to the ground floor to sell her your novel. Now if you're still expanding on the idea of the, well I set it in this wonderful world and, and uh, first the earth cooled and then the dinosaurs came and then she's, she's gone, she's, she's disappeared. So you need a very simple sort of strap line that, that makes her go, oh, tell me more. And the, the more simply you can distill that idea down. And if people want to know more, they will ask you. The worst thing is when you see people edging away because you've been going 20 minutes to describe the idea behind the book and you haven't got to the heart of it yet. And they're, they're going, well, I have a train to catch. Um, I came up with a, an idea for a supernatural book, which I'm going through sort of final edits in at the moment. And people say, well, what's it about? And my first answer is, well, there's no werewolves, no vampires, and no zombies. But it's about a supernatural assassin that you summon with grief and you pay with your soul. 
and that's all I say. And either people want to know more, or they go, yeah, I don't read that kind of stuff. In which case, I haven't wasted time telling them the whole of the, uh, the, uh, the earth cooling and the dinosaurs bit. So, it's, I also like in my books to, have to decide in my mind, even if I don't bring this out, to, uh, that I have some kind of a theme. And uh, in some of the books, it's, uh, it's a theme, well, this character is, is really looking for redemption. She's searching for redemption, and how is she going to find it? And that's something you just have in the back of your mind because it flavours the book. It's not supposed to be there as a very strong, you're not trying to lecture to people, you're just trying to keep in mind that this gives you a flavour that ties the book together. So I do outline, I'm one of these people who does write myself an outline before I start, not just my, my little jacket copy, I write myself a, a fairly comprehensive outline, but it's only the main structural elements of the book. What I don't do is decide in great detail what the reactions of the characters are going to be when they reach those main events. Because I want those reactions to be a more of an organic process. I don't know my characters well, apart from my, my recurring series characters, but the other characters I don't know well when I start the book. I don't write long character biographies for them. I don't decide who their parents were, where they went to school, what their favourite colour is. Because until they start to talk to me within the book, I don't know them. And they arrive and they start talking. And sometimes they completely rewrite their part when I wasn't looking. And this has happened on a, a few occasions. And a prime example of this is Charlie's father in the book. Mm -hmm. she, she works initially in the, the beginning of the series. She's ex-army, she's come out of the military in, in somewhat in disgrace. And she's earning a living teaching self-defense to women because it's, uh, it's something she feels very strongly about. Um, the, the further the series goes on, I wanted to evolve the character. I wanted to, to make her go on a personal journey throughout each of the books, as well as the individual plots, the individual stories. So her parents come into this as, as recurring characters, and her father is a consultant surgeon. Therefore, he tends to be quite cold and very clinical and is based absolutely on every consultant surgeon I've ever met. Um, and they are, there is a certain level of arrogance to him, I, I have to say. But he utterly stole the show whenever he appeared in the book. And I thought eventually, I am going to have to give this guy, you know, he's going to have to be the main focus of one of the books. So when it came to writing a book called Third Strike, I thought, well, what would be Charlie's absolute nightmare? Well, it would be a bring your parents to work day. <laughs> so she ends up having to, to protect her, her own parents, who are not only very reluctant to be protected, but they have deeply disapproved of the way she's chosen to earn a living. So there's, there's already some character conflict there before you throw in a major pharmaceutical company who's trying to discredit him, and the story picks up from there and goes on. So I happen to outline, that doesn't mean to say that's the way it's done. I think sometimes I come to events where I'm, I'm doing uh, workshops with writers and they expect that I will give them the secret handshake and welcome them into the society. You must, you must line, align your desk in an east-west direction and use a certain type of pencil and you will be a writer. There are as many methods of getting the words on the page as there are writers out there. And whatever works for you, you could write and just start with a sentence and see what happens, or you can outline it to the nth degree. And although the people who tend to be right by the seat of their pants will say, oh, I get bored with the book if, it, uh, if it's outlined. If I know what's going to happen, then, then I'm not interested, and, and my readers won't be interested either. But Jeffrey Deaver right. writes 100-page outlines before he starts writing. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey Deaver is one of the best writers out there. P.D. James used to do the same. So there are always you know, people on either side of the argument. What I do, and even if you write by the seat of your pants, I think is, a, is a, an interesting idea to consider, is I make a list of my cast before I start. And sometimes I don't have their names until later on in the book, but if, I, if I've got a list of names, then I write down an alphabet and I put a little tick above each letter for a first name and a little tick below it for each last name. Because that way I avoid having too many characters with names that start with the same letters. 
uh, I read a, a book by a, a, an Icelandic writer, and everybody's character in the book started with a letter, their name started with the letter E. And I thought, well, maybe it's an Icelandic thing that I don't understand. And then they had an expat American character in the book, and his name was Edward. And I thought, this is just, this is just going too far now. So it just helps me keep the characters very separate in the reader's mind as well as in my own. I try and vary the length and the shape and the endings of both first and last names, just to keep, help keep those characters distinct. Um, and a, a name is very important, a very important part of a character, because a William is a very different character from a Wooly, or a Billy, or a Bill. They are very different people. The way you shorten your name or the way other people shorten your name says a lot about the character. So um, you can use random name generating websites, which I have done in the past for villains, so I'm not having people saying, you've made me the murderer in your book. Mm -hmm. um, I also go and look at um, what the most popular names in given towns or countries or uh, different um, areas are, and that's very useful. So. If you're looking at a character's name for an area you're not familiar with, you know you're not going to choose a name that's completely unsuitable. So, um, just have a little look here. I'm not doing It's Jim. Yeah, that one's not good. So I may begin to slur a little by the end of the evening. Don't worry about it. Um, even if you don't outline, I also do a summary. This sounds like an awful lot of paperwork to be doing as alongside the actual writing. But I do a summary as I go along. And I just do a paragraph for each chapter I've written saying day one, day two, day three, because at that stage maybe it isn't important that it's a Sunday when something particularly happens, but it may be later. And also you tend to find that by the time you're halfway through a book and you want to say, hmm, did this happen two days ago or three? I can't remember. And you don't want to be spoiling the flow of things by having to look back. So knowing from my, from my summary you know, how many days have elapsed, I did in one of the books manage to insert a nine day week, which fortunately a copy editor spotted and I was able to correct that. But it's the kind of mistake that can easily creep in over the course of months of writing a, writing a novel. So I make a note of the, of the day, I make a note of whether it's day or night, whether it's raining, because there's nothing worse than your character arriving in a downpour and leaving on a, you know, in a heat wave if they've only been inside the building for half an hour ago. <laughs> Why they can do that? Um, I also make a note of, is the character carrying any injuries? Because if they're limping in one, in one chapter, you don't want them springing over a, a, you know, a, a ten foot wall in the next. And I make a note of just a very quick gist of any important conversations that have happened in that chapter. And by the time I get to the end of the book, I've probably got 30 pages of, of summary. But this means if an editor comes to me and says, this plot thread doesn't really work, we don't like it, or could you expand this plot thread of these characters, I can make my alterations on the summary, which is an awful lot easier than having to work with 300 printed out pages of TypeScript, where you can't quite decide where things happened and you can't remember which chapter things happened in. So it's a really useful idea when you go back and work on the novel, and it also allows you to look at the shape of it as the story goes on, because you've got that little crazy. So I find that uh, very useful. Now, finding your jumping off point, as I've said, um, I like to try and see where the jacket copy ends and where, therefore, logically, the reader expects to open the page and find themselves in the story. And it's what's known as in media res versus ab ovo either in the middle of things versus from the egg. In, in sort of a narrative technique, it's the practice of plunging you into a crucial situation right from the outset. It comes from Homer's Iliad, which starts with a quarrel between Achilles and Agamemnon during the Trojan War. Um, and that gives you an immediate interest in those two characters and what's happening in the story. Whereas if you were going to start right from the beginning, you'd start with the birth of Achilles. And that part is told, but we need to know that he's got this weakness, we need to know all that, but it, you need to also grab the reader. And Homer understood that even all that time ago. So, oh, sorry. Uh, definitely G. 
or tonic next time, <laughs> and a lemon. So you're always looking to increase the complications for your protagonist. And you're looking for the what's the worst case scenario, what's the worst thing that could happen. So you increase the, the dilemmas, not just throw in another car chase, throw in another explosion. I think it was Chandler who said when he felt the plot was flagging a little, he'd have a guy walk into the room with a gun. So you need to increase the moral dilemmas, the ethical dilemmas, as well as the physical dangers for your character. And it's often a good idea you can create this tension for your character by isolating them. Isolating from them from their friends, from their backup, from um, you know the the taking them out of their comfort zone basically. And if you're doing a, a, a book that isn't a first person narrative, you can also look at things from the from the villain's point of view, from your antagonist's point of view, because if you make your villains real people rather than caricatures, good people will behave badly, and sometimes bad people will have moments of honour. It's not always going to be the case that the chief bad guy will machine gun his henchmen when the going gets tough. Mm -hmm. And that creates some interest. I like characters with shades of grey. And quite often I find myself warming to the, to the villains more than I warm to the, the, the characters that Charlie is, as a bodyguard, supposed to be protecting. Hell if I wouldn't last very long as a bodyguard because I'd be saying, eh, I'll shoot them. <laughs> so you also need in a, in, a, in a mystery or a crime novel, you need something called the MacGuffin, which Hitchcock described as the mechanical element that usually crops up in any story. In crook stories, it's almost always the necklace, and in spy stories, it's almost always the papers. So in the Maltese Falcon, we have the actual Maltese Falcon. That was the MacGuffin. That was the thing they were all trying to track down and the reason people were killed and people were prepared to kill for it. In Casablanca, we have the letters of transit that they were trying to get hold of. Uh, and in more modern cases, there was a, a wonderful film called Ronin with uh, Robert De Niro that came out a few years ago. It's one of my favorite films. They're all after the case. You never find out what's in the case. It drives you mad. Mm -hmm. But the story is still a hell of a ride, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Enjoyed, enjoyed it. Uh, one of the later Mission Impossible films, there was something called The Rabbit's Foot. You never find out what mm -hmm. that is either, but they were all prepared to, to uh, you know, practically blow up the world to achieve it. In one of my books, I had as a, as a MacGuffin a computer program that could predict the stock market. And there are, there are programs that track the stock market at the moment, but this was one that used a little bit more of, a, of an artificial intelligence to actually be able to predict where the stock market was going to go. And people were prepared to, to kill for it. So as long as it's something that is uh, reasonably um, feasible that uh, somebody would be after that, then you can go with whatever MacGuffin suits you. Um, Quite often people say in, in books that a greater level of accuracy is required, and we've talked about real versus realistic. Your books need to be realistic, not real. But it seems to me in the movies they get away with an awful lot more mistakes. And that's because they're, movies are a lot more passive. You sit there and you let the story kind of wash over you. And they're fast enough to get away with huge errors in geography and history and anything else. And um, whereas books, they're active, the reader has to participate in the book, they have to be reading the story, they have to be more involved in the story. And the book is also a lot easier for the reader to put down if you do something stupid that jolts them out of that story. So they go, mm, no, not gonna read that any further, you've made that silly mistake. I mean, I remember reading just on a, a lot of people criticize gun mistakes in, in crime and thriller books. And this is why I do a lot of exhaustive research with firearms that I don't enjoy at all. Uh, it was also the reason I, at one point, was driving across Germany at about 180 miles an hour. Purely research, no enjoyment. <laughs> um, I'm planning on, on setting a book on a yacht in the Mediterranean. <laughs> anyway, that, that's another story. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I remember... Uh, reading a book where, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be something technical like guns, it doesn't have to be, it can be a bird that somebody, your a main character sees nesting at the wrong time of the year, it can be a flower that's in the wrong soil, in the wrong place, 
Uh, I remember reading somebody's novel where they had a, fem a young female horse and they referred to it as a colt all the way through. Mm. It should have been Philly. If you know anything about horses, you go, well, I don't trust now anything this, this writer tells me. Because quite often I will read a book and I will hope to pick up little snippets of information that are things I didn't know. And if they tell me an outright blatant lie, and I know it's a lie, I distrust then all the, the other information that I'm, that I'm being fed. So you also have to, have to decide when you start writing your book about whether you're going to write it as, as a single character or whether you're going to write it from a lot of different characters' viewpoints. Now, I would have loved to have written the Charlie Fox books in third person, but she just didn't talk to me in third person, and therefore I went with first person. And that has its own limitations because you, you cannot have any information coming into this, the story that the main character either doesn't witness for herself or she has to be told about or find out about in some way. And that can be a little stodgy if you have to have somebody, you know, a little deus ex machina coming on and explaining what happens. It, it can start to, to get a little slow. Um, so you have to make sure very much that you keep the pace going. Uh, if you have third person, you can shift points of view from your different characters. You can leave one character just at the point when the reader thinks, no, don't, don't. What was going to happen? And therefore they've got to read on to find the next section. You can stretch time as well. That's always a nice thing to do in a, in a, in a book. Because in real life, there is a thing called the tacky psych effect. And it's when people are in uh, car crashes, when they're in explosions, when they're in violent situations, they say, everything slowed down. And that is a, is a noted phenomenon that, that you can do in literary slow motion. So you can have things suddenly slowing down and that can make things very dramatic. Um, you can also, if you're writing a, a thriller particularly, you have a ticking clock. That's, you know, that, keeps the, uh, that keeps the pace going. And sometimes it can literally be a ticking clock. In one of the books, I, uh, Charlie's looking after somebody who, who gets kidnapped. And from the previous victims, they know the point at which one of them ha was already dead, and the clock is approaching that point. So are they going to find this girl alive? Is she going to be already dead? The clock's winding down all the time, the clock's ticking. When you get to your endings for your book, that's where things get tricky. To me, the most difficult part of a book, the start is great, you're still, you're still woo, full of ideas, you're throwing things in, you're throwing ideas, you're throwing rocks at your main character, they're up the tree and you're throwing rocks at them. You get to about the halfway point and then you have to start, you've got your, your story up, then you have to start winding things off towards the end of your story. You have to start that arc on its downward slope. And that third quarter of the book is the bit I always find the most difficult. If you answer too many questions too fast, the ending is going to fall very, very flat. If you leave things to the last minute, you're going to have 50 pages of one character sitting there saying to another, but I don't understand how you knew it was the man with the wooden leg. And they explain. So, and quite often you will have, um, you know, at one time this was, the detective would assemble everybody in the library and say, I expect you're wondering why I've called you here. So, in fact, the word denouement means unknotting. So you're unravelling those large, you've spent the first half of the book tying knots in your plot and then you have to unravel them and that's what denouement it means. Um, so you're, you're unravelling your story so it comes to a, a logical end that kind of works in terms of time as well as uh, a story. And um, we've talked a little bit about um, the authenticity of, um, of the books. I do a lot of research, but then I'm very nosy, and I like to know stuff. And they say, write what you know, and I completely disagree with that. I write about the things I'm really interested in finding out. Because you've got to live with this book for months, sometimes years. So you need to be really interested in the subject matter. You need to be really keen on finding out that information. And Although there is an awful lot you can do on the internet, there is no substitute for going there and finding things out in person or talking to people who have been there and done that. Uh, I remember in, in Second Shop, I set a book in, in Boston. It's set partly in Boston and partly in uh, the White Mountains of New Hampshire. 
and I had that contrast between the big city and the rural area and I wanted to kind of make that um, make that contrast between where you felt safe and where you felt in danger and, and play with that a little bit. Now I set one of the scenes in the Boston Aquarium and they have a brilliant website. You can go on, you can do a 360 degree video tour, it's wonderful. But it's not until you actually go there you find that when you walk through the front door, it's an open plan uh, room they have, or a building, they have the penguin enclosure in front of you and they're all you know, diving about in the water. They have a cafe on an open plan upper level. So the first thing that hits you when you walk in is the smell of fried fish. <laughs> Which I thought for an aquarium was a little unfair on the inhabitants. You know, maybe it's maybe it's a warning. If you don't swim interestingly, next week you're on the menu. So you know, and it's those little little bits of things because you do a huge amount of research and then you try and leave about ninety percent of it out. You are not writing a textbook. You are not writing a guidebook. You just want the little bits that make people think wow, this person really knows what they're talking about. They must have been there. I was, uh, I was very pleased a few years ago, I wrote a, a short story called The Night Butterflies, and I set it on the island of Bali. And um, I took it to, I was in a local writing group, I took it to a, a, one of the, the sessions, we, we were critiquing it, we read the story out, and somebody who had been to Bali said, well, you've obviously been there. And I said, no, we never set foot on the place. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody who has been there thinks I have because of the details I put in the book, then that's, to me, that I've got it right. Mm -hmm. I've managed to, I and mean, there are always times when you're not gonna get it so right, but we gloss over those and we don't talk about them in public. <laughs> um, so, you never let the truth get in the way of a, of a, a good story. You, I know that's a, that's a bit of a cliche in itself, but you can bend the rules a little. I like to take reality and then go, but what if that happened? But what if? What if? And you can take reality as your starting point and bend it. Breaking it may be not quite so good, but you can certainly bend it, and it's surprising how flexible it will be if you, uh, if you bend it hard enough. I yeah. think on that note, the, the what if and the questioning of finding out more, maybe we can open up to yeah. audience Q&A. Anybody have a question? Ooh, good question. <clears throat> so you talked about that you outline first, <clears throat> and then, but you also said that uh, you don't really know your characters until you're writing them and they're talking and they're speaking and doing these things. So I wonder um, how much you have to modify your outliners. Your, do you not change the structure of the plot? Well, the structure is, is only really the main events. So when the characters arrive at those events, there is, there is some wiggle room for them to behave in a way that, that by the time I've written the character to that point, seems natural to me. What I, I don't like to do, and I hate this when I read books, is that somebody's got a jar full of backstory, and they've gone, right, first chapter, and they've emptied the jar out, so all the backstory lands in the first chapter. I don't know these people yet. I don't want to know where they were born, where they went to school, how they got married. I just, I'm not interested. It's like if you're sitting on a subway train or a bus and somebody comes and sits down next to you and they start telling you, apropos of nothing, their life history. You get off at the next stop, even if you weren't intending to. Whereas if you sit with them every day on the bus and every day they, you get chatting and they tell you a little bit more and a little bit more and gradually you find that person really interesting and you really want to know more. So I wait till later in the story before I start to sort of explain. I mean, the people will react in certain ways because of what's happened to them. Your, your reactions are dictated by your life's experiences in a lot of ways. They certainly are for my main character. Um, but you need to grip feed those to your reader to keep them interested, to keep them wanting to know what's, what's coming next. Yes. Um, I was, while you were talking about Absence of Light, which is the novella set uh, in, in the aftermath of, well, we're presuming an earthquake, uh, but, but some natural disaster where, where Charlie has to go in and, and work with the team that is identifying the bodies and rescuing the living. Um, and you were talking about it and, and about how there's the forensic pathologist and the structural engineer and so on. 
And I suddenly thought, oh my god, Zoe writes these completely modern, tough chick, kick-ass books. Could not be farther from, say, golden age British mystery. This is a country house mystery. It's it, right? it's, it's, a a closed, it's, it's a closed world. Nobody can get in yep. or get out, and you have a whole bunch of suspects. And, uh, mm -hmm. Well, there are there are only so many plots. It's putting a new twist down. It's putting a new spin on them. So uh, there is a, a science fiction writer called Peter F. Hamilton, and some of his stuff is very science fiction, very very. Um, but he also did a, a, a sort of what I would call near future uh, trilogy set in the UK, and they're not this you know they're kind of normal science books rather than what might be called a dog beater of a book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. And one of them is a lot ring mystery, <laughs> but it's a, it's a science fiction, but it's it's a traditional lock room mystery, uh, and they find out nobody could in the in the locked room who was in the locked room with the body could possibly have committed the murder, but clearly somebody did, and it very much wasn't a suicide. Um, so there are only so many. But it's you put your own unique spin, and that's what you bring to your to your crime novel when you're writing. If you're going to write mystery or thriller, it has to be you have to put your stamp on it and your voice on it. I mean, I've I've got some some opening lines. Unless anybody has another question. Uh, yeah, can you hold those for yeah, a minute? please. Uh, are there more questions and stuff? You can I'm do. curious more about your research. Like, it seems like you have a lot of technical stuff, but also like medical that, that you reference, like guns. You have knowledge of when you write about it, and but but the new series you're talking about is a CSI person, um, or the yeah, standalone. It's, it's a standalone. So how do you research like what a, a CSI officer does? Um, like the TV show. I was I was lucky to go and spend some time with um, the CSIs, and this is UK set, and. The nice thing is when you write, I don't know if it's the same in the, in the States, but when you write a UK um, sort of where you're dealing with any of the police, even the names for the jobs vary from, from the different police forces in different areas. Because I spoke to one guy who said, they're not called CSIs, that's American. He said they're called Scenes of Crime Officers, or SOCO, they're known as in the UK. But I worked directly, I went to, to see the, um, the CSIs in Cumbria, and that's even how they answer the phone. <laughs> so they are very definitely CSIs. And you like um, do a visit, an office visit, or something? I I did a visit. Um, I've got the the books that they use for actually training the CSIs themselves. Uh, there is a guy called um, Ian Pepper in the UK who was um, he was a, a CSI and he's now writing crime fiction, so he's quite happy to provide information. Over here, there is a guy called Doug Lyle, DP Lyle, MD. You can you can Google Google him on um, you know on the internet, and he's actually got several books of a doctor answers mystery writers' questions, mm -hmm. and he's published several books. So he's delighted to have you say, "I want to have my character shot, stabbed, you know, drowned, and pushed down a flight of stairs. What would his injuries be? How would you know time of death?" And he will come back to you practically like a swinging door with the answer to all these questions. So he's very, very useful. And you never know who you're going to find, and one person leads to another. And now, I mean, when I first started, the internet wasn't, this day to be horrible, the internet wasn't as active, shall we say, as it is now. But now you can find people who have been there and have the knowledge and have done that. And that's great because there really is no substitute. Uh, I mean, in, in one of the books, in Second Shot, the title kind of gives it away, I have Charlie shot twice on the first page. And I needed to know what that was like. And I'm not such a method writer that I was prepared to actually go out and, and have myself shot to find out about it. Um, so I happened by chance to meet somebody who had been the victim of a robbery and had been shot during the course of the robbery. And I spent some time talking to him about what he felt, and what the after effects were. Yeah, it was very, very interesting because a lot of the pathology sites you find on the internet um, are just that. The patient is kind of died, so they're a bit difficult to question them about their, you know, their feelings about the incident. And uh, he said that it was, it was the immediate problem, he was shot in the stomach. 
and they were worried about that aspect. But actually, the, the round settled very close to his spinal cord, and it burnt the nerve down into one leg, and that's been the the long-term problem for him. So the stomach injury healed without too much problem, but the leg was an ongoing thing. He's still got nerve problems and nerve damage because violence in books must have consequences for me. Otherwise, it becomes a cartoon. You know, you you can't. Otherwise, they're like it's like people are whacking around them, each other around the head with frying pans, and there's a sound effect going, going sound effect going clang and clang. <laughs> it means nothing. It's a cartoon. And quite often I find it's the, it's the quiet deaths that, that resonate more. One of the books, Roadkill, I took a group of, of young guys who were motorcycling, and Charlie, obviously, on a road trip around Ireland. And I wanted to play with preconceptions to start with because the most of the time, the only thing you see about Ireland on the news are the terrorist activities. So I wanted to play with, with that aspect because it's not all about terrorism in Ireland and I also wanted to um, show that not everybody who rides a motorcycle you know runs a meth lab that those two things seem to be connected in some people's minds and I knew that of these guys who went out one of them was not going to come back and I put off making the decision about who that was going to be until the last minute um, and I, it was difficult because by this time I knew these guys they were you know I've been living with them for, for months and I really didn't want to, to kill this guy off. And therefore, his death, I found, you know, it was quite affecting. Whereas if you're doing the cartoon violence, it just, the reader goes, oh, another one. Okay, the body count's rolling up. I watched um, a spoof movie recently. It's an old spoof movie called Hot Shots. And the second one, they do a spoof of Rambo. And at one point, they're having this massive firefight, and there's a counter at the bottom of the screen, <laughs> rolling around the body count, and going bing every time it gets to a movie where they've overtaken. And at the end of, you know, they've gone way the most, the highest body count in any movie, and the characters kind of stop and high-five each other on screen. <laughs> so it gets a little bit like that. You don't have to have people dying on every, on, on every street corner, but the violence you have has to matter. And it came up, I've been at the BoucherCon Mystery Convention over the, the last weekend, and the subject of violence, you know, how much is too much? Well, a very small amount of violence is too much if it is, doesn't serve a purpose within your story. There is a big difference between graphic and gratuitous, and a very small amount of violence can be gratuitous if, well, why is that there? It doesn't do anything, it doesn't... People say, oh, well, it, it illuminates the character. Well, yeah, but maybe we knew this character was capable of that without you having to go around beating up little old ladies. But quite often, if you, if you feel it's needed in the story, you can have a higher level of what would be considered graphic violence if the story needs it to be there. And that's a very fine line. And only you as a writer can choose what you feel is the difference between graphic and gratuitous. And I've never been a fan of what I would call gore porn, which is basically these loving descriptions of either um, uh, murders or rapes or... I just don't like that. I mean, one of the best fight scenes I ever read in a book was a book by a lady called Sylvia Hamilton, who's now passed, unfortunately. And it's a group of knights sitting around um, uh, a campfire at night. And this, an argument develops, and they start to argue. And one of them jumps up and draws his sword. And then there's three asterisks, and the next scene starts, he took the dead man's horse. <laughs> you don't need any more than that. If it's not necessary, why put it in? It's a little bit like the, the whip versus sword scene that was supposed to be in the Indiana Jones, the first Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. Mm -hmm. Um, on the day they were supposed to shoot it, Harrison Ford wasn't feeling very well. And Spielberg said, well, okay, you've got a gun, just shoot the gun. <laughs> and it's become a vet. They ripped three days of shooting out of the script and went, way, and carried on. And it's become one of the most memorable scenes in the movies because you don't expect it. You think you're going to have this long, drawn-out fight, and you don't expect it. So you have to go with the unexpected. On that note, I know you have lines up, but I'd like to get people over there okay. to have you sign books. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel like I need to go home immediately and write a new book. I only have one last thing to say. Oh, yes, please. That persistence in writing is everything. 
there are more persistent writers published than there are talented writers mm -hmm. published. There are so many people who still have a book in a, half finished in a drawer somewhere yeah. that could be the next Pulitzer Prize winner, but they've never quite got around to finishing it. So you really do have to get right to the end and type the end on the page before you can uh, before you can get anywhere. But the best of luck to you all. Oh. Thank you.